Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the side event, um, Ending Trafficking for Sexual Exploitations, Lessons Learned from Survivors and Activist Movements. Um, it, is, it is an important event because it's going to feature the work from all across the globe, both from um, civil society organizations and their experiences in, uh, in addressing trafficking for sexual exploitation as well as from um, a survivor leader who's doing same. My name is Tatiana Kotlerenko and I am the OSC uh, Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights Advisor on Anti-Trafficking Issues. We have um, an interesting event um, ahead of us today. Um, and with that, because these are short events, actually, I would like to introduce Iona Bauer, who's the chairwoman of Ilia Berari Romania. And I would like to ask you, um, in your view, uh, what would be the best approaches to ending trafficking for sexual exploitation globally? Good morning, everyone, distinguished delegates, uh, esteemed colleagues. As Tatiana mentioned, my name is Iwana Bauer. Um, I get the privilege to lead the board of an organization called Eliberare, mainly focusing on Romania, but also working regionally and globally. Um, and the whole idea is to figure out uh, exactly the answer to this question, Tatiana. So unfortunately, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to unpack that in uh, the brief minutes that I have. But I can tell you some of the things that we have been doing and that have um, been proven to, um, to actually work, uh, and also the things that we still um, need to work on. Also, I wanna just take a moment and thank our colleagues from uh, Equality Now for um, all the support and for co-organizing this. And also, Tatiana, thank you so much for um, moderating and also all of the incredible work that Odir has been doing um, across the globe on, uh, on this issue. Um, so if we've learned anything in our extensive work is that if we don't address demand, it's almost like we're failing by default, right? We're working uh, to stop a hemorrhage by applying band-aids if we're not actually looking um, at what drives um, human trafficking, which is, um, which is demand. To put things into perspective, since we are here uh, at UNODC, um, we all live um, in some time in which um, we are very much affected of what's happening across different borders. So whenever um, on, on the 24th of February, actually, we heard um, from Secret UN Secretary General that uh, the war in Ukraine uh, is not necessarily a means of um, or a reason um, of concern for many people, actually for traffickers and perpetrators, this is an opportunity. And uh, what the, um, the victims are, are women and children. And we've seen that um, during, the, during the work that 90%, uh, actually 95% of victims of human trafficking are um, women and children. So if we think about that statement, we see that traffickers aren't the only ones mentioned that are profiting from um, the, the horrible times and armed conflict. There's also people who are called predators there. Um, and I don't know what you're imagining when you hear predators, uh, but there are studies that have been done as far as um, who predators um, who fuel demand for sex trafficking are. And the results are quite, um, quite surprising. Um, a study done by Melissa Farley, the latest one that we have is in 2015. Actually, it was um, a whole team of researchers looked at the people who who are willing to um, pay for sex, to exchange money for sexual services. And these men were um, mostly white men, Caucasian, um, around 40, um, mid middle to um, higher income. Um, also, they were um, college educated. So um, actually, two thirds of them had either graduated from college or attended some form of college studies. And 61% or more were either married or in a committed relationship. So if we think of predators, I don't think we necessarily think about pretty much um, most of the um, 
men uh, that we work with or that we have as neighbors um, and so on. Now, if we correlate that actually with an analysis that was done by Thomson Reuters um, in relation to the armed conflict in um, Ukraine, this was done in March. So right at the beginning of the conflict, we see that some of the searches that have skyrocketed were in relation to um, sexual abuse and sexual exploitation of women, respectively. Um, searches for Ukrainian escorts, uh, Ukrainian rape porn, um, or Ukrainian refugee porn, um, they went up to anywhere between 200% and 600%. Now, I want to bring to your attention that this was when the news were being flooded with pictures of women uh, who were crossing the border with just you know a, a handful of their belongings and probably two or three kids. Um, and these were not women who were coming in um, searching for jobs. They were actually displaced by armed conflict and their um, loved ones, their husbands, their fathers, uh, and so on, were left behind in Ukraine fighting. And yet these were the searches that were going up um, on the internet. So correlating who is actually paying for sex with these searches um, actually tells us a lot about um, who was doing the, the search. Now, why is this important? It is important because this particular dynamic, dynamic actually makes uh, human trafficking profitable. We're not going to go into very simple ninth grade economics, um, but basically the market regulates itself, right? If there's a, a rise in demand, uh, basically there's going to need to be a, a rise in supply. And if we are to look um, at what's going on, um, we're seeing that there's, um, um, there's a search for women, there's a search for children. So where is that supply going to come from, right? Now, addressing demand is actually a legal obligation under the Palermo Protocol, Article 9.5. Um, it's not voluntary. Uh, it's very clear language that countries shall address demand. It also talks about how uh, demand needs to be addressed. We're not talking just about policies and um, legislation. We're also talking about education. We're talking about measures uh, for deterrence and so on. Also, we know that the OSCE actually talks about addressing demand. So we also have the uh, ministerial council decisions that, that speak on that. For all of the EU countries, uh, we have the uh, directive on human trafficking. Uh, we also have CEDAW. We have the Council of Europe's convention um, on action against trafficking in human beings. These all have very clear um, um, very clear uh, policies or very clear obligations that are stated um, on addressing demand. Um, somehow, this is not necessarily working in, in practice. We are still missing the implementation of these provisions. Um, it seems like we're failing because we still see that, again, 95% of the victims of human trafficking are women and girls. So what is um, uh, what are some clear steps that we can take um, just to briefly uh, touch on your question, Tatiana. One, we need to ensure that international obligations are clearly transposed into national legislation and that countries um, actually embrace models that have worked. We've seen the equality model, and I know that um, my colleagues are also going to be, be touching on that, but basically we need to stop putting the, uh, the burden on the vulnerable people to no longer be vulnerable. We need to also take into consideration the power imbalances and the, the poverty dynamics that are um, at work when we're talking talking about human trafficking. I was actually listening to Diane Martin, a survivor from Scotland yesterday, and I know that some of you were also in the room, but she was talking about how the men who pay for prostitution are also the men who pay for uh, human trafficking victims. There's no way that you can differentiate between that. So it's the same uh, people putting money into this. So trying to figure out how to differentiate between the two is futile. Also, we need to make sure that we address the different loopholes, allowing for different websites or businesses uh, to call themselves something else when what they are is actually facilitators for human trafficking and exploitation. Whether we talk about, I don't know, classified websites um, that... Um, pretend that they're running different um, ads for other things, but actually under the, um, the section for um, dating, what we end up seeing is victims of human trafficking who are being sold openly, or, or whether we're talking about the um, 
the different other businesses, whether they're, you know, model agencies or uh, whatever they want to call themselves, we need to ensure uh, that there's strict liability, both for platforms and also for um, for the businesses. Otherwise, what we're doing is we're just uh, perpetuating a culture of impunity and we allowed predators to roam free. And third, we also need to ensure that awareness is doubled by educational programs um, and also that education is complemented by clear deterrence and disruption measures. Um, I'm going to go back really quick to the study that I mentioned. Uh, the behaviors of those who are willing to, to pay for sex were analyzed. Uh, and what deters them uh, is actually not a less than empathy. Um, a lot of them know that their victims are in there on their own accord. Actually, what deters them is uh, having their names published or making sure that um, this goes on their records in a way, shape, or form. Um, it's about having this crime um, exposed um, and it's fear basically that they're gonna be found out that actually works. So deterrence um, has to also be matched with whatever uh, research shows us that works um, when it comes to this. Um, now, I want to, to leave you with this, and this is something that I want to keep reiterating. Basically, um, if somebody um, sexually assaults or abuses a person once um, and they're caught, they're called a rapist. But somehow, if somebody continues to abuse and rape someone and exchanges money for it, they end up being called a sex buyer. Um, that is um, a very difficult um reality in which we need to navigate this because basically what we're doing is we're finding excuses uh, to continue to allow for demand to flourish um, and also um, just going back to the words of uh, UN Secretary General Guterres, if we are to think about the other people who um, could be found as not caring about the conflicts that are happening is each and every one of us who actually chooses to be a bystander rather than getting involved and making sure um, that those who are victims or survivors of human trafficking lack the protections that they need. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ioana, and thank you so much for pointing out that 95% of all trafficking victims for sexual exploitation are women and children, and the real solutions that need to be undertaken so that the burden is not put just on sending countries to fight trafficking within um, their borders, but the burden is also put on receiving countries who are the ones creating the demand to actually address it. And as you rightfully said, the EU directive doesn't just talk about addressing trafficking in human beings or the demand for trafficking in human beings it's also it also speaks on reducing trafficking in human beings uh demand for trafficking in human beings which um is an important point actually um to address and the knowing use piece that doesn't actually work in practice because it's very hard uh, to prove that someone um, actually knew whether the person that they're buying was a victim of tra uh, trafficking for sexual exploitation in practice. And very few cases as such have been able to be proven and, uh, and penalized. So with that, actually, I'd like to move to Catherine, um, who is the executive director of Live Bloom Services International in Kenya. And Catherine, I have the first question for you. Live Bloom Services International provides support to young girls who have been trafficked for sexual exploitation in Kenya to rebuild their lives. What approaches are you um, using in this work and what is the impact? Uh, thank you very much um, for having me and uh, thank you Quality Now for putting this together. Um, I'll start by mentioning that any time a girl or a boy or anyone is sexually exploited, they come in um, in a package of trauma and psychological instability, physical instability, and anything that goes with it. And when we receive the girls, uh, then part of what our model is, is that we make use of the same community. We engage with the same community that the girl is coming from. And mainly because um, most of our the sexual exploitation cases that we have have a cultural component in it that goes with it, or are um, around matters uh, tourism, which is a major thing, economic thing in Kenya. And um, when we talk about using the community or engaging the community, um, we're talking about their parents to this girl. There are people who um, raise the flag 
there are those who rescue the child, maybe alongside our staff, and how do they come in and how do we develop their skills to be able to not just put a stop at it, but also um, become the champions for prevention at the community level. And through the years, what we have done um, is to develop one of the models that is called the peer uh, mentor model. And this is for girls who are survivors of sexual exploitation. And in every group, there's leadership. There's a center of leadership. And when these girls identify how many or who is the leader amongst them, then they are able to forward that name and that person joins or that girl joins a cohort of mentors and mentors who will learn through the curriculum again uh, that, that talks about uh, adding sexual exploitation. They're the ones who will for, um, be able to facilitate their sessions when they have education sessions. They're the ones who raise the flag when things go bad at the community level, they actually become the champions, not just outside of school, but also in school, where we have girls who have formed the Champions for Change Girls Clubs. Uh, so far, we have six schools that have such clubs with more than 100 girls in every school, where again, the girls who facilitate, the same survivors will facilitate the distribution of sanitary towels, and when I say that some of our, um, the girls that we rescue, the reason for vulnerability that leads to exploitation is because they even cannot afford a packet of sanitary towels. And so provision of these necessary sanitary towels and food and whatever else is so important for them. Uh, we also engage the community to identify champions who become mentors in the African context. Any adult is an auntie to a particular child. It, you don't have to be related by blood. We call each other auntie, uncle, whatever. And they have a position. They have a very big stake in terms of building um, this child to develop into what they want to be. So we have a group of mentor mothers and mentor fathers who act as aunties and uncles to these children and who will also act um, as our bridge between the bridge between the community and Life Broom, which is our organization, and also the service provision uh, facilities like the hospitals, like the courts, the police, and everybody else. And away from that, of course, we have the referral mechanisms. Um, and here we're talking about engagement of stakeholders. There's nowhere we can go without engagement of the government and the government laid down institutions. We have laws, we have instruments in Kenya, we, they have been domesticated. What is needed is how do we make use of these stakeholders or the, the referral, referral pathways to ensure that these children receive what it is that is needed. Uh, we have children that we support through school. One of the reasons why they were sexually exploited is because they could not afford um, money to take them to school, their families could not. And as a result, Equality Now has supported uh, and continues to support very many girls to be in school and to continue all the way to vocational skills training um, and to high, uh, through high school. Um, very important also is that we have a curriculum that we engage, that we uh, was developed in partnership with Equality Now and other stakeholders and the girls themselves. They, part, they took part in um, the development of this curriculum which trains them on how to say no, how to stand up for their rights, how to be able to navigate, even when they're coming from very, very poor backgrounds. And um, all what we're doing is to ensure that we encourage the expansion of safe spaces, which is led by the communities themselves. If this is not done, then we'll have the girls moving out um, as migrant workers as they grow older because they're still vulnerable. But when it is stopped at that stage, then it gets easy. And what impact are we having? We have expansion of safe spaces, as I said. We have lowered cases of re-exploitation. And we have girls going back to their families where they first came from because counseling and therapy and whatever services are needed have been accorded even for the family members. Um, and we have justice followed, um, the process followed by the lawyers who are pro bono. Um, and we have snowboarding of children teaching each other so that safe spaces could just continue to expand. And more so, 
engagement of the community using the strengths that they have on the ground is such a big thing. Maybe in just one minute, I could say what it is that we're looking, asking the government to do. We have the laws, we have the protocols, we have the instruments, but we're asking that in Kenya, we can have one ministry take care or be the parent ministry for uh, matters, human trafficking and modern forms of slavery. Every year, there's like we move from we are moved from one department to another. At the end of the day, we don't know where we belong. So following through on where to go to when there are cases becomes such a big thing. Um, and another of the things that we're asking is that the government can help unpack these instruments and bring them all the way down to the community. This is where the people we are talking about who are trafficked, this is where they're coming from. They come from a community somewhere in this world. So if this is brought down in a way that we understand that the community can understand, the chief, the elder, the mothers, the fathers can understand, then they'll know how best to educate their children along those lines. And lastly, that our community also um, is able to stop normalizing sexual exploitation because that's one of the biggest challenges that it is okay that this girl, uh, this man slept with this girl and has been exploiting this girl in this way. And then there are Kagaru uh, courts and all that. If the community is sensitized, then we have um, all this being taken care of. And of course, the survivors and witness protection and support is very, very much needed through an expanded budget. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. And thank you so much for really focusing on a community-based approach because that is key in actually ensuring protection, destigmatization of um, survivors and victims who have been exploited. Um, Ruchira Gupta will not be able to join us today, but I wanted to mention actually in that respect that she also has a 10-step approach on a community level, which talks about the last girl, because the point is, is that until every last girl is protected and supported within those communities, they become vulnerable to trafficking. Mm -hmm. And also the importance of the national referral mechanisms. Um, uh, a colleague of mine is uh, handing out a flyer all across. We have an event tomorrow on the national referral mechanisms. And um, my office earlier this year launched an update uh, of the national referral mechanism handbook which is actually a uh, survivor informed from cover to cover and provides a really strong uh, set of tools uh, that are practical for um, all aspects of addressing uh, trafficking in human beings from a victim and survivor centered and human rights perspective. So I hope you can join us there tomorrow. But going back to uh, inclusion of survivors voices, um, I would like to introduce Jane Lassender who's a survivor of human trafficking, international speaker, author, and founder of Red Alert Task Force. And Jane, I would like to ask you actually from your perspective, how can we address uh, demand for human trafficking so that, um, or specifically for sex trafficking so that we no longer are counting victims and talking about 95% of women and girls mm -hmm. um, being victimized in trafficking for sexual exploitation and break the cycle. Yeah. Thank you for the question and thank you everyone for being here. Um, I don't really know where to start. It's just, I'm going to start with my story, which is I have lived experience of being trafficked, of men buying me, owning me for sex. And I don't call it sex buyers in my head. I call it rape buyers because then they're just raping people and uh, I mean why it's legal I don't understand my my mind does not understand how it can be legal to buy somebody who is a victim of trafficking traumatized sometimes tortured taken away from their families vulnerable vulnerable people mostly women but also men how can it be okay to say well you can own this person you can buy them because if it was such a punishment and illegal then I don't think it would have happened to me and I've spent more than 40 years of my life being totally traumatized I didn't trust any men because I grew up as a child and a teenager thinking that men 
just wanted to buy women for sex. That's how I grew up and that's what I learned. And I mean, it's lucky for me now that I can be a voice. I have a wonderful husband. I have a wonderful son. I have friends who are men. So they have helped in the healing process. Men who tell me it's not okay. And why is it even legal? And in the places where it is illegal, why aren't these people being punished? And like my colleague said, having a record against their name, being put in prison, being named and shamed, because it is not okay. And I, yeah, and I'm going to share a little bit of my story, take you on a journey with me so that you can maybe understand a little bit from my perspective. Um, I was as a child and as a teenager um, trafficked to a gang of men and a very violent gang of men. I was many times in hospital, had many injuries. And do you know, not one doctor in a hospital ever asked me, are you okay? I was underweight, I was terrified. I couldn't look them in the eye. I was dirty. And nobody thought, why is this child coming in again with a broken arm, with a fractured skull, with bruises? Why is she not speaking? Why is she? And they just, you know, put a plaster on me, sent me home. So that's one of the points where I think that we need to change the system. We need to teach medical students how not everybody has a, a label on their head saying, I am a victim of trafficking. And when things were being done to me, I was had a knife at my throat. And the men were telling me, if ever you speak about this or tell anybody, and if ever you go to school and you're looking miserable, trying to get attention, or you're talking to your teachers, we're gonna find you and we're gonna cut you in pieces. I've got scars where they showed me what they were gonna do. And I'm gonna put you in the freezer. And when you're a child of 10, 11, 12, you do what they say. So people would tell you maybe from my past, oh, she was a happy child. I was happy in the mask, but I wasn't happy inside. But if somebody asked me, are you a victim of trafficking? I would say, no, no, everything's okay. So that is, that is terror. And these men used to rape me, not just one, but many. And a woman's body is not made to be raped 10 times a day. I mean, I had many injuries, many problems. And yeah, I still do, I still suffer. When I was 13, I was taken to hospital by one of the men and forced to have an abortion. I always still think what would happen to that child if it had lived. So that's the trauma that I carry with me. It doesn't go away. And these men would laugh in my face because the, I would see them laughing with each other because they knew they wasn't gonna get punished. It's like, it's normal, it's okay. If you say something's legal, you're actually saying it's okay. And it's not only like the, the victims who are in danger, it's what are we teaching our children? Are we teaching our children it's okay to abuse a woman? Because that is not okay. When I was 15, I managed to run away. I couldn't cope anymore. I was completely traumatized and I ran and I ran to a train station. I stood and a fast train was coming. I lived in the UK. And I was just about to jump in front of the train because I just felt invisible. I just thought nobody sees me and I'm worthless because people buying me week in, week out, year in, year out, different men laughing at me, they were telling me you are worth nothing. And just before I jumped, something stopped me. And I just had this strength rise up, which said, don't jump, be strong, you go out and you stop it happening to somebody else. So that's what I'm trying to do. And I've, I, I ran away to Israel. I ran away to every country because I ran away from myself, but I had to bring myself with me. And it's not any different in different countries. And I once woke up in hospital three days in a coma just because I couldn't cope anymore and I tried to end it all. And then I thought again, no, Jane, don't let them break you. You're gonna go and you're gonna, Tell people how you feel. And we are not only traumatizing victims, it's not only the victims that I'm talking about. I want to tell you a true story, which I saw with my own eyes. When I was living in the Netherlands, I used to go and help 
and work in Amsterdam with the girls in the red light. I could, I could tell you all day traumatic stories of these girls who were trafficked, not only from all different countries, but from the Netherlands as well. And girls as young as younger than 18. And everybody said, oh, it's legal. These girls want to stand there. And the girls would put on a smile because the traffickers would walk around and watch them. And one day I saw a girl covered in bruises and she said, I wasn't smiling enough. And he beat me because he said, the police would start to be suspicious. So I had to be happy. And I stood one day in, in the room, in the red light room, talking to a girl who was totally traumatized, telling me how she was taken away from her family, four little children, taken across to Germany, taken to Amsterdam. And she was told, if ever you try to escape or tell anyone, we're gonna kill your children or we're gonna rape your children. So she stood there and I was talking to her and she was crying and she was, I mean, I had tears all over me. And at the same minute, I watched a group of school children walk past with their teacher. And he looked at the windows and he said, this is our beautiful culture. And the children were laughing and the girl said, it's not the men that breaks our spirit and our soul. It's this, that everyone thinks it's okay to do this. And another day I was talking to a girl and I said, how did you get into this situation? And she said, I, I don't have a broken home. It's not always about people in broken homes. I have a normal family life. I went with my school one day when I was 14, we walked along the red light and a man came and talked to some of us at the back, the girls and asked, oh, what school do you go to? So we told him and he said, oh, I live near there. A couple of weeks later, he was outside our school and he called us and my friends didn't wanna come. So I went and he was so nice to me and he gave me attention and some of you know, not all my friends were being nice to me. So I was feeling a bit lonely. So he invited me out for a cup of tea. He brought me presents and then he started to force me to take drugs. Then he said, I owed him. Then he put me in the red light and now he's threatened to kill my sister. So we are bringing our children on a plate and saying, here you are, here's our children. Not even the vulnerable ones. The vulnerable ones are the ones that always traffic, but there are exceptions, there are. So why are we doing this? So what I want you to do now is everybody close your eyes. And I want you to imagine somebody who you really love, a daughter, a sister, a wife, a mother, just put this person in your mind and imagine that somebody abducted this person, took them away, put them in a hotel room, put them in the red light area, took, doesn't matter where, but people could come and have sex with them, rape them, beat them. They couldn't come back to you because they were terrified. And everyone said, but it's okay, it's legal. Because if it was illegal, and the punishment was so bad that they were so scared because they were named and shamed. They wouldn't do it, I can promise you that. So I don't understand why it takes weeks and months and years to discuss, should it be legal, what sort of punishment? It's just a no brainer to me. And I just wanna say today, Let's do something together. Let's do action together. Let's break the circle so that the next generation won't be sitting here telling the same stories. Thank you for your time. I'd like to thank you, Jane, for um, your resilience, your courage, for sharing your story with others here today. And for the, for the words of your lived experience and your truth, um, it's often, you know, that we do not hear from survivors of, of trafficking um, and prostitution, and we actually see the glossy pictures uh, of what the world would like us to see, mm -hmm. because it is a big business all across, and most of the time, as you have said, it targets women, migrant women, actually, or women from uh, countries with a lower um, economic development. Um, and the realities are just not seen. And that actually also wanted to mention uh, that about two years ago, 
um, OSCOD or launched the International Survivors of Trafficking Advisory Council. That has become a game changer because this is where we have um, a group of survivor leaders from all across the OSC region who through their lived experience, just like Jane, uh, are able to impact policy and uh, ensure that policy legislation and all actions that are taken on human trafficking are taken with inclusion of survivor voices because this is where the solutions really lie. They're not about theory, they're about practice. Um, uh, with that, actually, um, Ruchira is not able to join us today, and we're having technical uh, difficulties uh, screening her a message online. Um, I would like to actually uh, take another minute and actually ask a question, uh, Ioana. Um, we, have, we have spoken here about the work that goes on on the ground. We have spoken here about the legislation that is needed. Um, in your view, specifically, if you talk about, for example, Ukrainian women now, um, we, we have uh, been doing actually even jointly quite a bit of work on this. Um, I've shared briefly with you the, some of the preliminary survey findings from the research that OSC Udir has done in terms of asking them what's actually happening on the ground, where we see that some of the children are being exploited for production of child sexual abuse materials. We see that women are being targeted at refugee centers or whilst they're looking for work online for uh, the purpose of sexual exploitation. What, in your view, what would be the next steps or what should governments be doing overall to prevent this? Thank you so much, Tatiana, and actually just highlighting the fact that um, you went and asked Ukrainian women about how uh, we can better protect them. I think that's um, that's key, right? Ensuring that there's a platform for their voices to, to be heard. Um, our organization has hired uh, three Ukrainians, two of them um, are women, and they've spent nine days in bunkers uh, before actually getting to uh, Romania, a journey that should have been a few hours, ended up taking them um, almost close to, uh, to two weeks. Um, and we've talked about um, what happens along the way, and we've talked about what does uh, a reception center look like um, We've talked about how, in theory, um, the different protection um, protection models that can be accessed look like, but then what is the, the reality on the ground? Um, and actually, one thing that they've mentioned and one thing that uh, we've also um, found in the from the ODIR um, um, survey is that um, we cannot talk about this enough um, and not in a sensationalized way, uh, but from a perspective of having actionable steps uh, for the women who may be faced with um, different um, exploitative offers. Uh, we're moving slowly from anecdotal <laughs> to actually um, cases that are being um, referred to authorities, whether we're talking about uh, labor exploitation. Uh, we've seen cases in which actually um, you have agencies, labor agencies that are brokering accommodation. And uh, if somebody refuses to um, have that accommodation, Basically, there's a conditioning of humanitarian help and people end up being um, exploited through through labor. So making sure that we're not conditioning humanitarian help, uh, making sure um, actually that we discuss about this um, whole idea that um, most of the Ukrainian women who end up in the red light are there because they choose to do so. Maybe we can take just uh, a step back and realize that not half of the population of the displaced women who are leaving Ukraine want to be uh, prostitutes. This is not um, a choice. So uh, getting away from that and actually expending knowing use um, punishment to uh, everyone who ends up buying uh, Ukrainian women is something that um, could be easily done in a way to um, to protect these, these women and the children. Also uh, taking into account the uh, profile of Ukraine before you already mentioned that kids are being targeted uh, for the production of sexual abuse 
use material. Um, so ensuring that we actually don't have a legislative void when it comes to online sexual exploitation and sexual abuse um, is very, very important. There are different pieces of legislation that are right now in debate. So ensuring that there's actually provisions um, in order to combat that and also um, to have the, the protection and the safeguards and the referral um, is so important. You've mentioned the NRM handbook um, for all of the representatives of the different states. I think this is such an important piece, ensuring that there's a functioning NRM that includes proactive identification and specifically going and screening uh, this population, which is by default um, it, it has by default compounded vulnerabilities just because of the gender, just because of the age, the, the conflict displacement um, and everything else. So maybe another statistic that we should mention is that we're at less than 1% of victims of human trafficking who are being identified. So even the ones that end up sharing their stories, that's less than 1%. So do we have proactive identification or are we in this rhetoric that, oh, there are no, no cases yet, but <laughs> basically go going back and figuring out why there are no cases and seeing, hearing from survivors actually how indicators need to be adapted and how the identification process and the access to services needs to be um, modified and eased. Um, that's also something very, very important. So the all the protection models should have a component of um, preventing and combating human trafficking and all of it needs to be done proactively because otherwise what we're going to end up um, having in a, is a situation in which um, we are relaxed because we don't see the, the identification happening yet but then we realize that it's not happening because we're not actually proactively looking for it. Thank you for such a comprehensive answer, actually, because that, that sums up actually what we actually, in reality, what needs to be done. And Catherine, I just want to ask a quick question of you as well, because you talked about a lot of actually children on the ground that have been trafficked for sexual exploitation. What can be done in terms of ensuring their uh, integration and social inclusion where they do not remain vulnerable to re-trafficking for years to come? Well, thank you again. Um, one of the things that must be done is to um, not just empower the child or the children themselves, but also empower their families. One of the reasons why they are uh, vulnerable to sexual exploitation or any other form of exploitation is because they lack basic needs, it's because they lack an education, it's because they lack, well, in the very basics of the sanitary towers and the like. And when we have a focus, which is not a cut and paste or a copy and paste focus that is happening in Uganda and then it's brought into Kenya or in Kenya it's taken to India. Instead, we look at what is it that is happening in that community? What are the trends in this small community? And how, what are the structures that can be uh, strengthened, especially in terms of um, supporting the parents or supporting the households to be able to become more uh, economically, uh, stable and over and above that um, encouraging the schools or the school systems to be able to adopt education whether it is uh, in the social education aspect education that touches on some of these very very important aspects because it's out of ignorance that children just like Jin has said uh, that children fall into this kind of thing they they trust they wake up and they trust anybody and everybody. And then what happens once they start being exploited, sometimes they think it is okay, it is part of life. But if this information or education is given early enough, I believe that this can help turn around, not just for the children on the ground, but that they also become champions. Their parents or their households become champions. And at the end of the day, then we are preventing we are preventing these children from becoming vulnerable when they are older and maybe even having to leave the country. And just one more thing, that uh, a call to all of us, especially those of us in the civil society, the UN Secretary General in 2019 uh, gave the three uh, action points, the one for global action, the local action, and the people action. And at the people action level, if we all can support our communities to become as innovative, as creative as possible, to be able to create movements, however small, then the spaces that are safe 
will just enlarge, not just for the children, but for humanity for now and into the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for that powerful message, actually, um, and, and the fact that um, children just need to be protected as children, you know, wherever they are in the world. And sadly enough, and I, I remember, um, and I worked quite a, for quite a few years in West Africa, actually, I looked at the statistics of how many girls are targeted for sexual violence in school which creates the cycle of normalization of sexual violence throughout where children do not actually realize that this is not a part of life or this is not a regular occurrence to be sexually exploited or abused. Um, and with that, actually, I have a final question uh, to Jane. Um, in terms of um, why is inclusion of survivors' voices important in addressing uh, trafficking for sexual exploitation? Well, I think that, oh, sorry. I think that a survivor has has to, has the lived experience and the insights, and they understand how how the mind of not only a victim thinks, but also how a trafficker works. So, you know, I've spoken to many people who don't understand the situation. They don't understand that a woman would be traumatized because they haven't experienced it. So by like advising and talking about my own experiences, experiences of other people, it's only then can we share and can the insights become like the reality of what's happening. That, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it can't be done without <laughs> the voices of survivors. I think everybody on this panel, and I'm hoping in the audience agrees with the fact that inclusion of survivors' voices is key. In, in, in any work um, in combating trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation. And before I hand over to Tsitsi Matikari um, for a closing remarks, we have a few minutes for questions if you have any. And if you do, please raise your hand and we would be happy to address them. Please. No, I just wanted to say that actually, I really am very moved by this panel and very moved by your story, um, Mrs. Can, yeah, Jane. Uh, uh, and I think it's very important to listen to this. And uh, my question is also, uh, does why does in a healthy society trafficking has any place at all? Because in a healthy society, then we don't, we, it shouldn't be a space for it. There should not be a question that this is not a right kind of behavior. So why are so many excuses are still found in all the, these countries yeah, to still have it going on? Yeah. So I think it's very good to, to, voice, to voice this. We, have a, we are from Women Federation for World Peace International, and uh, we're having a side event tomorrow morning about um, healthy, relation, uh, healthy development for young people, having different people speaking about helping young people to create a healthy lifestyle, yeah? to how you become a person that is contributing to society, because then you don't, you don't need everything else. Yeah? You don't get into slander or criminal activity. Yeah? So this is a kind of the prevention from another angle. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll start with the very basic answer and then I can hand over to everybody else on the panel. Uh, two thirds of all profits uh, uh, of human trafficking are made from sex trafficking. So um, um, with different estimates, but something close to $99 billion per year are made from sex trafficking. Uh, the sex industry makes significantly more. So a large chunk of it is actually profit. And a large chunk of it is also profit off of those that are generally marginalized, highly vulnerable, um, and uh, cannot really stand up for themselves or are largely invisible. Um, so that would be the answer on my part. And I don't know if any of the panel members would like to join in any of the answers to this. Did I say something? Um, I just remembered one time when I went to a prison and I went to speak to a prison, a men's prison, and I actually spoke to a trafficker who was in prison. And he actually was laughing and he said, it's like a hotel here. My, my brother is still trafficking all my women and my bank balance is going higher and higher. So I go out, if I get caught, I don't get a big sentence. It's just a joke. So until we get them where it hurts and 
put them longer in prison <clears throat> and take their money away and use it to help the victims recover. I mean, that's just not happening. And I think that that just keeps it going because they don't care if they go to prison for, for a year or two years because they're still earning big money. You know, how can this be possible? So, you know, it just, I don't understand it in my mind how we can let this happen. And if I can add something really quickly, Jane, you mentioned you were still in school. Uh, you mentioned that you were going to the doctor. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to expand it to a whole of society approach, actually. If we're just looking at law enforcement and the judicial system, we're failing on a, a whole bunch of different levels here. Um, you know, we and again, going back to referral pathways and to national referral mechanisms, why is it important to actually have medical um, professionals trained and to have clear referral pathways for uh, medical staff? Why is it important for uh, teachers, educators to be, um, to recognize the signs, to be trained, to recognize the signs and to know what to do, uh, because there's this whole fear. Why is it important to actually ask the difficult questions, um, all of us, right? Because we can also, as members of, commu of the community, we can also report uh, potential cases. We don't have to go and do investigations. That's not what we're supposed to be doing, but we're able to go ahead and ask our neighbor um, what is doing and be our brothers and sisters keeper. And if we see something, it's important to actually go ahead and report it. Um, but making sure that these structures are in place where referrals actually happen and there's uh, successful outcomes. Thank you so much um, for actually pointing out the other side of it. Um, yes, please, in the back. Thank you. Hi, um, thanks, first of all, for sharing your testimonies, for sharing this information. I think it's real important. And as so civil society organization advocate preventing human trafficking, how can we contribute to this without like, how can we amplify your voice instead of talking just by yourself, you know, like all the activities we do, how can actually add up to what you are already doing? I guess I could quickly start with the fact that it needs to be strategic, uh, where civil society organizations, uh, international, uh, intergovernmental organizations, survivor movements need to come together to create strategic approaches um, that are actually focused on impact or impact driven uh, in terms of um, addressing and actually eliminating demand for sex trafficking. So that would be a, a quick answer on my part. I don't know if anybody else would like to add to this. Yeah, real quick, survivor engagement, because I think I'm, I understand this is what you're asking, not speaking on behalf of survivors, but ensuring that we create platforms for them to actually share their stories. I think making sure that they're protected, make, making sure that um, they do this in a way that they feel comfortable. ESTOC was mentioned here, in International Survivors of Trafficking Advisory Council, which actually um, be, you can benefit as a CSO from ESTOC. Um, you can have consultant, consultants from ESTOC on how to successfully um, engage experts by experience. Um, and our organization has benefited so much after actually including an expert by experience um, in our organization. At the same time, nobody knows who she is. She's never presented like that. Um, and it's, she's not there because she's a survivor. She's there because uh, she actually contributes so much, adds so much value. And literally, um, we cannot see our work going forward uh, without that, that type of engagement. But the NRM handbook actually talks about how to do this in a trauma-informed way um, and there are different e resources that can be can be accessed thank you so much Anna. and we have a question here <laughs> uh, thank you very much uh, i'm carol from action for youth development uganda uh, mine is actually i'm impressed and this builds the momentum already on the movement that on the things that we're already doing for the girls and young women that are being trapped my my question is not actually real different from what she just talked about it's about how collectively can we work together as stakeholder to me i want to look at the recommendation that we can take home on how we talked about learning and unlearning and, and looking at the best practices 
experiences that you have just shared with us. We are here, we are listening, but someone else who would benefit from this. For both advocates and the survivors, they need all this. And those that have been actually the ones who are there on how to learn from this. Uh, I, I would suggest that could we have like a, a reporting system, a referral system, which is online, based online, so that if someone is like in Africa, is in Asia, they are able to tap into the, that opportunity. It should be like a board so that we are able to learn from it. Otherwise, we people may not get to different websites to get the best practices that have been shared. But I believe that if uh, I'm from Action for Youth, I shared something, a story from Uganda, it will inspire someone from Asia. And then something is shared from uh, maybe Eastern Europe. And we can collectively work together, both CSOs, government, and then uh, international development agencies. Thank you. So a very quick answer as we are running out of time and we have a few more questions here is the National Referral Mechanism Handbook that is online. It has promising practices from all across the globe, as well as really practical tools for everything from child trafficking uh, to um, trafficking of adults, for various forms of exploitation, and the whole cycle from identification uh, and protection. Um, assistance and support, criminal justice and redress and social inclusion, as well as portions on health issues that relate to uh, victims and survivors of trafficking. So take a look at that. It's really easy to use, actually. Um, and it's, it's a huge resource and the basis of um, anti-trafficking frameworks and systems all across the globe. And then and we had a... East, yeah. Sorry, ESTAC is global. All good. Oh, I see. And then we have a question right there. Yes. Thank you very much for Jen. Uh, my question uh, is uh, the victims in sexual exploitation, they think there is no problem and it's okay. And uh, they are not, also they are not understanding they are in the situation. What do you think from uh, your experience what we have to do to raise awareness among uh, those uh, victims. For uh, Kenya, I'm asking about uh, the percentage of the victims, uh, bit, uh, I mean between the smuggled person and the citizen of Kenya, citizen. Uh, because when we spoke about uh, uh, human trafficking, uh, we think that always we think about a smuggled person. We forget our uh, citizen. Uh, so I'm asking about uh, the percentage between in the victims you 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 already had uh, identified. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. We have a report on the same um, online, and I might not have the figures off head, but um, it, it's very important what you mentioned about um, not being able to distinguish between smuggled persons and trafficked persons. And I think that's the reason why we are um, emphasizing on creation of awareness uh, through partnerships. And uh, in this case, all the way from up, all the way down and back, uh, in a way that people, especially at the community level, can be able to understand the judicial system, uh, the police and all that can be able to understand exactly what is, um, how to identify and what to do with those that are um, victims of smuggling, those who are victims of uh, sex trafficking, those who are generally in the violation um, component which is not necessarily, does not always be um, trafficking or not trafficking, uh, but you have quite a lot of information about Kenya online. Thank you. Hi, thank you. And thank you for um, all that you, uh, all of you have shared. I wanted to ask specifically to Catherine, I would like to go back to, um, you know, because sometimes we can get into, you know, the medical community, you know, or, you know, schools and, you know, um, the government, what can the government do? But I love uh, that you pointed out the mentorship piece. Um, because, you know, when we're thinking about mobilizing community, having community community 
response that's very key and important, right? That the community themselves are able to protect their own community. So I'm asking that you will um, expound a little more on the mentorship pieces. I think I heard you say that the mentors work with the families. Um, and when you say work with the families, and I, I, I think you're saying um, for those who are identified as being trafficked, the mentors are working with the families, but are there mentors that work with families, with kids, children are, that are high risk or, you know, I, I just want to know more about that because I think that's important when we're talking about the continuum of care to not forget this very important aspect, you know, for that to not be overlooked. So I'm asking you to expound on the mentorship piece, please. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, we have two levels of mentorship. One level is for the survivors, the girls who are survivors. And if we have a group of 10 girls, they will identify who it is who's going to get training on leadership, transformative leadership, and on mentorship. Um, it's very unlikely that a young girl will disclose to an adult that so-and-so is doing this and the other to her, but they will have the stories among themselves as peers. And that's the, 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 um, uh, the strength of the mentorship program that they will disclose to each other the same way that they don't keep secrets away from each other. And when the, the, um, the mentors, like in a group of 30, we have seven, the current group that is ongoing, we have seven. The seven uh, have their trainings happening every month. And this is both for the school and back at home. Uh, so that is one level. And the other level very quickly is the level where we have adults like you and I volunteering through our organization to become mentors to the families that are so vulnerable and where the children are coming from. Majority of the parents uh, or guardians of these children will either be alcoholics or they'll all be out um, in prostitution or any other kind of thing that does not support the girl through healing and whatever else. So the adults who are 11 today, the ones that we're working with, and some of them are actually probation officers, will start in the gap of a mentor for about three or four families, and we will follow through with the families on behalf of the government so the organization and the community. That's how we engage the community as far as that is concerned. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. With that, we are running out of time. I would like to ask Titi Matikari, who's the global lead to end sexual exploitation and equality now to provide us with some closing remarks. Yeah, um, thanks, Tatiana. Um, I'll just start off by thanking our speakers uh, for you know the discussion that you have had today and for raising um, the different issues that we need to be looking at to address uh, trafficking for sexual exploitation. Um, at Equality Now, we really believe in the power of the law to bring about change for women and girls. And, you know, the issues that people were talking about around addressing demand, ad around addressing inequalities that lead to vulnerability and services and support. Uh, we believe actually that, you know, this should be enshrined in national law as they are currently provided for within international instruments. And I think one of the points that really came across is that we need a whole systems or a holistic support is required where all stakeholders are coming together, you know, governments, communities, civil society organizations, survivors, and the private sector, the academia, that we really need to be pulling together our resources and working towards the solutions that we already know because they are, you know, enshrined in international law. We've heard from experiences from survivors and civil society in terms of what needs to be done. Um, and I think the two pillars really around protection and prevention also came out quite strongly in the discussion that we really need to be looking at, at both sides and actually that you know prevention is possible if we if we start to focus on on addressing demand and addressing you know vulnerabilities at the community level and so on um, so I hope that the discussion that we've had um, you know has uh, provided some motivation for us uh, to continue with the work that we are doing at, at the different levels uh, whether we are government civil society, intergovernmental organizations and so on. 
And at Equality Now, we really believe in, you know, movement building and being part of movements. Uh, so we are open as well to, uh, you know, partnerships with others to take this work forward. Um, and, you know, welcome for people to get in touch with us to see, you know, whether the opportunities for us to either support the work that you are doing or that you could join as well in some of the efforts that, you know, we are currently carrying out as Equality Now. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Tatiana, as well, for your moderation. Um, brilliant. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Titi. So this brings uh, this this event to, to the end, and I would like to thank you for participating here on behalf of OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, Equality Now, APNIAP International, and Iliberare. So thank you, and we wish you a good uh, day uh, here and a productive one. Thank you.